Hello everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today which is about how to write a strong application to the Community Ownership Fund. We're going to be focusing together today on putting together your management case. My name is Zoe Goddard and I work for Locality, which is one of the 10 community support organisations delivering the Community Ownership Fund Support Programme on behalf of the De Department of Leveling Up Homes and Communities. I'm joined today by my colleague Debbie Lang, who is going to be co-hosting the webinar. The Community Ownership Support Programme is helping groups in a number of different ways. We have useful resources on the My Community website. This includes webinars specifically aimed at sport and leisure assets, heritage projects, pubs and shops, which are delivered by our support partners. And we also have webinars specifically for groups applying in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. There is an advice service for any questions about COF or the support available. And we have inquiry handlers based across the UK. There are also in-depth support packages that will be available to some groups and these are offered to groups in areas of high need based on national metrics like the indices of multiple deprivation, um, the community needs index and areas with diverse um, communities and we also look at groups that have a clear line of sight to submitting an application. Um, our, gen our agenda for today is that we're going to give a brief overview on the Community Ownership Fund and the support programme. We're going to look at how you apply and the assessment criteria that is used. We'll give a short overview of the strategic case um, and then my colleague Deb Debbie will be looking at um, what is required to submit a strong management case and looking at the evidence required to back this up. So what is the Community Ownership Fund? The £150 million fund exists to help local communities across the UK to take control of assets, amenities or facilities that are at risk of loss without community intervention. That risk might be from closure, sale from either private owners or public owners, neglect and dereliction under current ownership, um, energy efficiency issues that threaten long-term sustainable operations because of the cost of running, the asset and other reasons for an unsustainable current business model. The funder has not made a definite list of asset types in scope for the fund because they recognise it's important for communities to identify what assets, assets matter most to them. Successful projects that have been funded so far include community centres, sporting and leisure facilities, pubs, cultural buildings, heritage assets and shops. Um, and the asset that you're saving must have had current or past community use and or have community significance. Incorporated voluntary and community organisations and parish towns and community councils are eligible to apply. If you can show that you can buy the asset freehold, um, obtain a long term leasehold of at least 15 years. Or alternatively, you might already own the asset that is at risk. Groups can apply for up to two million capital funding to purchase or lease a local asset and or to help pay for essential renovations. DLUC expect most applications to be in the region of £250,000. Um, um, applicants must have matched funding of 20% or more from alternative funding sources. And groups can also apply for revenue funding up to 20% of their capital ask with a maximum of £50,000. And that can help fund development costs and running costs in the first 12 months. It's important to note as well that grants have to be spent within 12 months of receiving an offer letter. So how to apply. Expressions of interest um, forms to check if eligibility will reopen on the Department of Leveling Up website in early March. The EOI form is going to become a fully automated self-assessment. If a group passes the expression of interest, they will receive an email straight afterwards with the result, which will either be a pass or a pass with caveats. And we recommend you check your clutter folders if you cannot find this email after submitting your um, expression of interest form.
All prospective applicants will need to submit a new EOI, even if they have previously submitted one. Successful EOI applicants will be notified of the launch of the new window when it opens in mid-March. This window, round four, bidding window one, will open in mid-March and close in late April, early May. Previously, each round closed at noon, um, but from now on, it will close at 2 p.m. We recommend that you use the Word version of the application form on my community to draft your answers um, before you start inputting um, the online application form answers. The reason for this is it's great to be able to then share those answers with your board and with other key stakeholders. And also, if you don't complete and submit your application by the deadline for a window, your work will be lost. So this is a really good way of ensuring that your answers will be kept. We also recommend don't leaving it until the last 24 hours to start your application form. You do need to, to upload um, various supporting documents and sometimes people encounter technical issues. So please give yourself plenty of lead in time to um, start your online application. And if you are unsuccessful, um, groups can reapply. Um, some key points to bear in mind. Um, please consider any caveats received in your EOI outcome and seek advice. Um, we have the advice service that you, come, that you can come to us to speak about any issues about eligibility. Those caveats are really important to look at because if you pass an EOI, it doesn't necessarily mean you are eligible. Um, so we can help in sort of looking at those um, eligibility um, issues or um, queries that you have. When you've submitted your application form, DLUC can only go back to applicants briefly during the assessment process. So they assess what's in the application form, your business plan and the attachments that you provide. So really, it's really important in your application to explain your reasoning and be really consistent. There are a limited number of attachments, so please refer to the prospectus, which lists what these are, to ensure you know that you can fit all the information that you need into your application. And we really recommend in your business plan to give examples, comparisons and research to really back up your figures. There are two elements of the application and assessment criteria, the strategic case and the management case. And this session today is going to be concentrating on the management case. But we really recommend that you look at the assessment criteria and scoring matrix on Deluxe's, on Deluxe's website, um, which really sets out what in detail is required to submit a strong application. And that document really is as useful as the prospectus for understanding uh, what the programme is all about. Um, some tips for avoiding problems problems later. Um, projects can't be changed after submitting an application. So we know that some groups in the past have forgotten to put in their revenue grant request to help with the year one running costs. So please, if you are, would like revenue funding as well, to include that in your application. Any costs incurred by your project before the deadline for submitting an application in the window that you're applying for will not be eligible as match funding. So we really recommend that you wait for um, the results of that round and, and receiving a grant offer letter before spending any match funding that you've secured. DLUC may take a legal charge on the building. So please consider this if you're taking out loan finance. COF is also subject to procurement rules, so it's really good to be aware of these before choosing any suppliers, even before submitting your application, so that you can make sure that you're following the procurement rules that the funder uh, is, is, is wanting. Also, seek advice if your organisation is subject to any legal action and check if any of your directors have been disqualified in the past, because this could affect your eligibility. So we have lots of frequently asked questions on the My Community website around eligibility and about the programme in general. Um, so please have a look at those resources. Um, but I'd just like to pass over to Debbie now to see, um, have you got any um, identified um, questions that come up a lot um, that you think would be useful to share today? Yes, I'd like to ask first, 
does an asset have to be for sale on the open market to be eligible for the community ownership fund? Um, so it's not a requirement of applications um, to cough that the asset must be on sale on the open market at the time of applying. Um, the important aspect is that you must demonstrate that the owner wants to sell and that if it is not sold to the community, this means that the asset is at risk of being lost. And that could be from private sales or also from public assets that are going through a community asset transfer or a disposal. That's really helpful. Another question. If we already own or have a long lease on our community asset, can we apply for refurbishment costs? Um, so the COF fund is all about community assets that are at risk of being lost to the community. So organisations who already own their asset are eligible to apply for funding to renovate that, their asset, provided that the asset would otherwise be at risk of closure or loss to the community without those renovations. So really, it's about asking COF to fund essential works um, to make sure um, that the, the asset is going to be sustainable. Um, nice to have renovations that improve the asset, but which are not essential to ensure its continued operation um, will not be funded. That's great. And one final question, Zoe. Does planning permission need to be in place? Um, you don't need planning permission in place at the time of submitting a COF application, um, but the COF, the application does need to demonstrate a clear line of sight to a positive planning de decision. Um, so, for example, you might be able to demonstrate positive pre-application planning advice received by the local planning authority. And the key thing here to consider is that you will need to draw down and spend the COF funding within 12 months. So it's about showing that you are going to be able to get that planning permission approved and then be able to draw down and spend the COF funding within 12 months. That's great. So we're now going to move on and look at the assessment criteria that the Department of Leveling Up Homes and Communities uses. Um, as mentioned previously, there's two elements of the application. There's the strategic case and the management case, and both need to achieve minimum scores um, in the application um, to pass. Please um, look at the assessment criteria and the scoring matrix on DLEX website to set out what is required to submit a strong application. Um, in that document, you'll find this um, table, which shows the different um, sub criteria for both the strategic case and management case, and also the weighting that um, the funder uses to understand how important um, each part of the um, application is. So I'll briefly just go through uh, what is looked for in terms of the strategic case. Um, there's a part of the assessment which is around current use, community, current community use, and the significance of the asset to the community. So you'll need to demonstrate who in the community uses the asset currently or has used the, that asset in the past. Um, if the community hasn't used that asset in the past, then it's really about looking at demonstrating why that asset is, is significant to the community and why the community want to bring it into community ownership and save that asset um, and use it to provide benefits to the community. You'll need to clearly articulate why the asset is at risk of loss and what that loss um, would do to the community, how it would affect the community. You'll need to show that what the asset will be lost without community intervention and why the asset is better in community hands in community ownership. Um, in the engagement and local support section of the assessment, um, the funder will be looking for you to demonstrate how the community has been consulted and shaped plans for the asset going forward, how you can demonstrate local support for your asset and how you are going to manage it going forward. Also, how do plans for the asset fit with wider plans for the area? You might have a neighbourhood plan or there might be other local community plans um, that can show um, how that asset fits in into, the, into plans for the area. 
and also how can you give details of local support from other partners um, that might be the council it might be other community organizations in your area um, you know who are the kind of big key stakeholders that are involved with perhaps delivering um, other services from your asset. There is a section of the strategic case which all looks at benefits. So what community benefits will your project deliver? What are going to be the key outcomes um, that you're going to deliver through this asset? How will planned activities deliver those benefits? How will you deliver and sustain those benefits over time? And how will the whole community benefit? There's also a section about environmental sustainability. So how will your project address environmental sustainability going forward? If you've got building works, how do your plans address this issue? Um, and does your project involve action and leadership on climate change? Um, to provide a, a good demonstration project for your community and encourage your community to get involved with climate change. So I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, um, Debbie Lamb, who's going to look in more detail at the management case. Hi, everyone. Um... Yeah, I'm going to be looking at the management case and we're going to be looking in a lot more detail at this. There are four elements to the management case, the funding breakdown, financial and risk forecasts, resources and skills and representation, inclusiveness and integration. So going to be looking at what the assessment criteria show as a strong application. So what information does the assessor require and what is the underlying information and documentation that you need? The funding breakdown covers the acquisition of the asset, the refurbishment of the asset and the match funding required. And all of that needs a lot of detail. If you're acquiring the asset, the information that you need to give would cover an agreed sale price or transfer terms. If you're purchasing the asset, you need to have an independent valuation. You may not be able to conclude um, a sale price prior to putting the application in. For example, if it's an asset which is registered, um, you may be in a bidding process coming towards the end of the moratorium. So um, you may not have an agreed price. Then you would need to be explaining the process. In terms of transfer, um, if you're looking at a community asset transfer from a local authority, um, often there can be lots of discussions about a transfer, but you will need a piece of paper which, where the local authority is agreeing to transfer to you um, and is agreeing that the asset is at risk. So it's about trying to tie down the terms of uh, the sale or the transfer as far as you possibly can before you submit the application. Um, you need to be thinking about the time scale to acquire. Um, if you're, for example, doing a community asset transfer, how long will it take the local authority to, pro to process that and produce a lease once you have got a positive funding decision from the community ownership fund? Also think about any issues which might affect acquisition. Are there covenants related to the building or the land? Um, do you need to seek permission from other people? Um, are there other people with an interest that need to agree this? In terms of refurbishing the asset, this covers a detailed breakdown of the work needed. Now, this is not, um, you know, our works are going to cost 500K. Um, this is about really breaking it down to say, 
the cost of our work is going to be eight eighty k for the roof um fifty k for the damp proof course thirty k for the heating system. It is breaking down everything that you need to do and giving a very clear breakdown. The best thing is to put this into a table um the assessor will want to know the details of the professional advice you have taken. How do you know what needs to be done to the building? And w it is expected that you will have had a condition survey done so that you know all the issues with the building before you actually embark on a specific programme of work. There will need to be milestones for completing that building work and that building work needs to be completed within 12 months. You also need to say how that building work is going to be managed. There's a sum to do, basically, which breaks down the funding. So you're looking at your capital funding request um, to the Community Ownership Fund. And that's based on the breakdown of costs of acquisition and refurbishment plus a contingency sum. You're looking at the revenue request that you are making to the Community Ownership Fund and how that will be used. That will give you a total request for funding from the Community Ownership Fund. You will then also need to give the total cost of the project and show the amount of match funding that is required. You need to say if that match funding is already secured or is still to secure. And if you still have match funding that you need to secure, the time scales for securing that outstanding match funding. So in terms of the funding breakdown, what makes a strong application? Full costings with clear explanations. No issues with eligibility. Now, Zoe mentioned that you will get an email back um, when you complete your expression of interest, which may have some caveats. You need to go back to those and think about them to make sure that your application is in fact eligible. And please do ask for advice if you're unsure what those are saying to you. In a strong funding application, all match will be secured or there will be a clear route to securing match within the time frame. The project plan will set out milestones to spend within 12 months. The purpose of the request for any revenue funding will be clear, showing how that revenue funding relates to the business plan and how it relates to securing the future of the asset. The next part is financial risks and forecasts. And I'm going to talk a bit more about this because this is the area um, of the management case that most people struggle with. So the financial and risk forecasts, what is asked for? Completed or planned feasibility studies. So that may be looking at how feasible it is to establish a particular community business and so on. You need to be going back to basics about what are the planned activities or services that you're going to deliver in the asset. Financial forecasts, including your income sources and your costs with an evidence set of assumptions. You're asked for an explanation of the use and need for community ownership revenue funding. You need to provide three years of cash flow forecasts and you need to uh, cover risks and mitigations. I'm going to talk a lot more about them in a moment. So, financial risk forecast, the kind of underpinning documentation that you're going to need are income and expenditure budgets, both for revenue and capital. You're going to need a cash flow forecast with detailed assumptions, revenue certainly, and revenue and capital combined if some of your match funding is being paid in arrears, because that will affect your cash flow. You will 
need to look at a sensitivity analysis. Um, that's really looking at what happens if some of your assumptions don't work. So what happens if your income is 10% lower? What happens if your costs are 20% higher? And finally, you will need a risk register. The underpinning evidence that you're going to need to produce those is around the feasibility of the building and the different income streams. Um, your operational plan, and by that we mean um, the very basic things about how the building or the asset is going to operate. When is it open? What staff do you need? What volunteers do you need? So that all that builds into um, your budget and your cash flow forecast. You'll need an understanding of your customers, your markets, and what competition there is, and how you're going to price your services. I said I was going to say a bit more about cash flows and risk registers. Um, this is an example of a cash flow forecast for one year. Remember, you need to do three years. If you have your own cash flow forecasting, that is absolutely fine. Um, just check to make sure that your cash flow forecasts contain all the relevant information. But if you're new to doing cash flow forecasts, um, there will be information on my community with a template for doing a cash flow forecast, uh, a worked example and some information about how to do that. I'm going to talk you through it very briefly here. Uh, you start at the top with income and separate that out into the various lines of income. So you could have, for example, a cafe. Uh, you might have uh, managed workspace. You might have grants and donations. So you'd be looking at when that, how much that income is and when it arrives. Um, on your, if you're doing catering, for example, you may have a peak of income in December. Um, your income in the next three months might be lower. Um, your grants will tend to come in annually or quarterly. So you need to be working out when they're likely to arrive and putting them into the cash flow forecast at the relevant time. Expenditure, again, is a list of um, all the categories of expenditure and then looking at um, when you're going to spend that money across um, the months of the year. Salaries, reasonably obviously, um, you're probably going to pay every month if you want to still be um, on speaking terms with your staff. Um, utilities, you might pay quarterly, you might pay monthly, it just depends. Um, some costs maybe like your annual accounts or insurance, you may pay once a year. So it's important to get that information in, in the, at the time you actually pay it. A cash flow forecast relates to when income actually comes into your business and when uh, expenditure goes out. The bottom four lines are the actual cash flow bit. And this organisation is starting in April with a bank balance of £12,000. So you take that, you add the income, you take away the expenditure and get um, a balance at the end. The bottom line shows the balance that should be in your bank at the end of April. That's then carried up onto the, the balance cap brought forward line. And again, you add income, you take away expenditure and you get um, the amount of money you should have in the bank um, at the end of May. What this is really useful for is pointing out times when your cash flow may get tight. This cash flow doesn't get tight, but many cash flows do. And if you're looking at getting to very low amounts in your bank or a minus figure, then it gives you advance warning of that and means that you can take action um, to make sure that you don't actually run out of cash. 
as I said, there's lots more information going to be available on my community. That does include a template, a worked example, and notes on how to complete a cash flow forecast. I thought it was useful to just look at a typical assumptions page for a cash flow. Um, you can have your assumptions page um, for three for a three year cash flow on one page in Excel. Um, cash flow assumptions just tell people how you have made the calculations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about assumptions because one of the things that we are told by the assessors at DLOC is that they want to be able to work back from the figures that you give them to how you calculated them, what makes up those figures. So it's really important that in terms of your income, you say how you've calculated it. These slides will be available on my community, so I'm not gonna go through these in huge detail, but you can see that the community cafe is broken down by customers, their spend, and the number of days that the cafe will be open uh, each month. And looking at quarter one, then looking at an increasing number, 10 customers in quarter one, 20 in quarter two, 30 in quarter three, 40 in quarter four. Really important, particularly if you are taking on a new building that you're not running before, that you provide adequate time for your earned income to build up. You probably won't have your community cafe full or your managed workspace full on day one. If you do have good reason to think that you are going to be full on day one, for example, your managed workspace, um, people are already signed up with an agreement to, to let as soon as you're up and running, then make sure that's set out in your business plan because uh, otherwise it looks as if you're being over optimistic. Similarly, on your revenue expenditure, think about when you're putting expenditure into this, think about why you um, think it's going to cost X or Y. So for utilities, if you manage the building already, you may well know what your current utility costs are. If part of your rationale for the application to the community ownership fund is that you're going to put in a new heating system and energy efficiency measures, then you may be able to justify that being lower than it has been previously. Um, if you don't have access to the building, then the best way is to talk to similar buildings, find out how much they're paying for utilities and so on. But show your workings so that the assessor can work back and understand and see that your assumptions and the figures that you put into it are sensible. I'm going to talk again about a risk register. Now, as I said before, if you already do a risk register, there is no need to change it uh, for the Community Ownership Fund. Just make sure you're covering the key points. For people who haven't done a risk register before, we find it useful to categorize risks so that you can think through each area of risk. So that's column one. Column two is a description of risk. So what is the risk that you're looking at? That could be in governance terms, you can't recruit and retain sufficient board members. In financial terms, it might be that your income is 10% below budget. Um, we would usually measure impact as one to five and probability one to five. So if you can't recruit and retain sufficient board members, the impact would be pretty high for the organisation. Um, and the probability, you know, you're thinking, well, we're OK at the moment, but actually we could do with it being better. So you're giving it a probability of three. You multiply those um those figures together to get a score before you've mitigated at 12. It's always useful to have someone responsible um, 
to assign responsibility within a risk register. So most of the governance issues would be down to the chair. Um, they lead your board or management committee. On financial, that might be the responsibility, might be the responsibility of the CEO or um, the finance manager or your treasurer. Um, it depends, but having someone who is keeping scrutiny and who is watching out for those risks is really important. When you've identified a risk, there may be things you can do to avoid or transfer or mitigate that risk. So when you're looking perhaps at difficulties with recruitment, you might put a succession plan in place. Think about how, what routes you could take to actually recruit more board members, more management committee members. You might decide to have an annual recruitment drive. You might decide to have a range of trustee training opportunities because many of your potential board members, trustees are interested in developing themselves. So we'll join your board because they get training opportunities. You may look at social activities for the board. Um, people may enjoy getting together with other members of the board. That may be an incentive for people to get involved. So the impact, um, you know, after you've taken all those measures, if they're not successful, the impact is the same. But actually, the probability of it happening is much lower. So um, you've got four times one, which gives a revised score of four. Often you would be looking at your risk register then to kind of say, well, you know, lower scores, we're pretty well green, we're okay with this. Um, scores which are amber are a bit more urgent and obviously any urgent risks would be classified as red. There will be um, a template, a worked example and some guidance on my community. But can I reiterate, if you've already got a risk register, don't rewrite it. Um, just make sure all the information is contained in it. And risk is about thinking about all of the risks that your project might be subjected to. It's not just about financial or not just linked to the capital project. Um, we think that there are main issues around governance, you will have risks around finances. You will have operational risks, um, you know, health and safety, things like that. You will have compliance risks if you aren't getting your returns back in a timely manner to people like Companies House or the Charity Commission or to your funders. There are a raft of external risks, um, many of which you can do nothing about, but you need to be keeping an eye on them. And, you know, many of the external risks we've been um, living with over the last couple of years, high inflation, particularly high inflation on things like um, building materials, skilled trades, food prices. And there's not much you can do except to keep an eye on it and to think how you and to try to be ready to deal with it if you see a trend. But external risks could also be flooding. Um, you know, if you have a building which is liable to flood, um, you know, your application to Community Ownership Fund may actually be around um, making that building less vulnerable. So it may be around barriers, it may be around roofing electrics higher up the walls and things like that. So there are some things you're going to be, some external threats that you may be able to do something about, others that you're looking at trends, but actually you can't really influence. Asset, if you've got a build project onwards, there are going to be risks involved in it and they need to be acknowledged and thought through, to see what you're going to do if they happen and specific risks. Um, as Zoe said right at the start, there are a huge number of different kinds of community assets that are part of this program. Um, the kinds of specific risks that you might run in running a community pub 
are hugely different from the ones that you might face from running a community garden. So think about the specific risks that might be relevant to you. A strong application in terms of risk and finance and risk forecasts would be a really clear business plan with details about how financial sustainability is going to be achieved. So how are you going to be able to run the building financially in the long term? A strong application gives details about any feasibility work that you've done. It will give clarity on the risks and the mitigations, the actions you're taking to deal with risk. There will be clear financial and cash flow forecasts with exhaustive details, justification of any revenue requested, uh, particularly if you're looking to spend cough revenue before you've actually acquired the building. And there will be excellent detail on planned activities and services. As I said before, the actual planned activities and services underpin all of the financial information. And we have some, we thought we would pull out a couple of frequently asked questions. Um, there are loads on um, the My Community website, so please do check them if you have some queries. Thanks, Debbie. I've got a couple of questions. Um, can we apply to the Community Ownership Fund if our local authority has agreed to transfer an asset to us, but we do not yet have the lease? The answer is yes. Many community organisations will not be able to conclude um, a community asset transfer um, without the knowledge that they have funding to do essential repairs to the building. What you will need is a letter from your local authority confirming that the asset is at risk and confirming that they will transfer the asset to you. Remember that funding from the Community Ownership Fund can't be used to purchase a building from a local authority. I think another key point is that if you're successful, as we said before, you'll only have 12 months to spend your Community Ownership Fund capital grant, well, and revenue grant, um, and that's from the date you get the offer letter. It's really helpful in terms of a transfer to talk at an early stage with your local authority about what the process is for them to produce a lease for you. Um, some local authorities, it will need to go through various committee stages and may take some time. So really useful to understand that at quite an early stage and to alert them to the timescales. Thanks, Debbie. Um, can you say a bit more about undertaking sensitivity analysis to help understand and manage risks? Yes. Um, I'm passionate about people doing sensitivity analysis. It's about stress testing your financial projections, asking what if. As I said before, over the last 18 months, we have seen... Um, huge challenges for people running community buildings around the costs of energy, the costs of food, and just general inflation. Other factors may affect um, the projections that you put forward, particularly if you're taking on a new building. You may find once you get the building that you actually need more staff than you expected to run the building, or you may not be able to recruit. Um, so you might have to pay staff 5% or 10% more. So a sensitivity analysis is about thinking about what happens if our costs are 5%, 10% or 20% higher than we expected. Similarly, although you've done all the research on your income, you may find out that it isn't as high as you had expected. Maybe, you know, you're not able to let one of your managed workspaces. Um, maybe the cost of living crisis is affecting use of your cafe. 
So you may end up with less income than you thought. Maybe a grant that you've had for many years and you've relied upon, the grant funder feels they can no longer support you. And it's about thinking about how fragile your business model is. What happens if your income is 5%, 10%, 20% lower? If you have done um, your budgets and your cash flow projections, it is reasonably easy to change the figures. Once you've got the baseline, you can do those changes and work out at what point your business becomes unviable. Now, this is something that the assessors want to understand that you've looked at, but it's more important than just an assessment. If you're taking on an asset, you need to understand how tight your business model margins are. Um, if you're only just breaking even, if a 5% drop in your income or a 5% increase in your costs would leave you running into deficits, then perhaps you need to look at your business model to see if you need to add activities, to look at other sources of income, to make this more sustainable in the long term. Great, thanks Debbie. And I'm now going to move on to look at other parts of the management case. So, particularly the third part is about the skills and resources that you have. What's been asked for within the application is the, relative ex the relevant experience of delivering similar projects, and that could be in the board or the staff team. Also asking for the roles which are going to be required to manage the asset your governance and membership structures and membership of your board, management committee, their role and main responsibilities. What we think is required for this is um, on the governance board and structures, you will need to provide board profiles, what roles they play, the skills that your board or management committee members have, how they make decisions, and their succession plans. Should also include any experience you have within the organization, in the board or in the staff team about experience of doing this type of project. <clears throat> if you don't have experience of doing this type of project, that is not a deal breaker, but you need to show how you're going to bring in expertise, which will help you to manage a capital build project successfully. You need to talk about the track record of your organisation and senior team about how of managing community buildings, about managing a community organisation. You need to give details of recruitment plans and understanding of being an employer. This is particularly important if you aren't employing staff at the moment. Um, do you understand what it means and the, the basic things that need to be in place for you to employ staff successfully and safely? If you are recruiting staff, have you done any research to make sure that you are going to be able to recruit staff? suitable staff um, there are it is really difficult to recruit staff in certain parts of the country and for certain roles at the moment so we are you know the assessors will be looking for how much do you understand your local market in this way and do you think you can actually achieve this but underpinning this is also paperwork and accounting do you have the policies and procedures in place, including those that you need to run a building? You don't have to upload loads of policies and procedures, but you are trying to demonstrate to the assessor that you do understand what is required. You will be a legal entity um, if you are applying to the Community Ownership Fund, so you need to make sure that your submissions are up to date to the Charity Commission, Companies, House, FCA, and so on. And do you have the systems you require? 
Um, many organizations which are taking on a building or expanding their services because they've been able to refurbish their asset may be looking at much higher income and expenditure than they've been working with previously. So do you need an accounting system? Do you need an HR system? Do you need a customer relationship management system? And thinking about those systems is really helpful. Um, potentially, if you need to install those kinds of systems, that could be part of what you do with a community ownership fund grant, revenue grant. And a strong application shows a strong awareness of the management requirements of the project, both the capital build and the ongoing management of the project once the build is completed. It will include track record and proven skills of managing similar projects. It'll have strong evidence of a well-functioning governance structure so talking about effective decision making, examples of how the organization makes decisions and examples of how it is planning for succession. Recruitment plan should be well, well progressed and clear and consistent information about the makeup of the board, showing that the board, your management committee functions effectively. And finally, we're on to representation, inclusiveness and integration and thinking about what is asked for. You're being asked how the views of the local community will be taken into account in running the asset. So that's you've done all of your consultation and involvement around the capital project. This is about once your asset is up and running, how is the lo local community going to be taken into account and involved in that? How will you be accountable to the place and the people who use the asset? The expectation is that you're accountable to the wider community in the area that your asset is based, but you may also have particular accountability to the communities of interest who may use your asset. So you need to be showing that and how will the asset be operated to be accessible to the whole of the community? In order to achieve that, and we think what would be required is a diversity, equity and inclusion policy considered in relation to all areas of your work. Um, Evidence that inclusiveness and integration has been considered in developing your plans for the asset. That's not just the physical plans for the asset, but the activities and the ongoing um, activities that are going to go on in the asset. You should be showing clarity about any membership structure. Who can be a member? What is the cost of the member? Are you actively seeking uh, more people to become members and the extent to which the board is representative or reflects the local community um, if you have a wide rate you, you know is your board um, you know a good spectrum of gender age um, ethnicity and so on are there any barriers to inclusiveness? Thinking about whether there's anything within the proposals you have which are going to affect whether the um, asset is inclusive. And there may be. Um, you know, if you are working with very vulnerable people, you may have safeguarding issues, which mean the times the asset can't be open to everyone in the community. So think about what those barriers are and think about how you've dealt with them in relation to inclusion, diversity and equity. So what makes a strong application in this respect? Information and evidence on accountability. And it's really great to have several examples of how the community is rooted, in, how the organization is rooted in the community. So examples of where um, 
the community has had a priority or has made a request and how your organisation has responded to that. Evidence of how the community will be involved in running the asset. A membership with structure with no barriers. It's proactive in seeking to increase its risk and is aware of the need to be inclusive in delivery of the project and use of the asset. And we're coming towards the end. Just some top tips from us um, on completing your application. Do the research. Make sure you can back up all the information you use. Provide explanations. Remember that it may be obvious to you, but not to someone who doesn't know your organisation and your area. Provide explanations wherever you think that's needed. And what can be really helpful is to get someone who doesn't know your project in detail to read it and point out anything that they don't understand or anything that is unclear. Just to conclude um, the webinar today, we also really recommend um, that you visit the My Community website. We have um, webinars specific to different asset types and also webinars for applicants um, in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Um, we've got lots of top tips and fact sheets about building your management case, top tips about how to submit your application and how to reduce the file sizes of your attachments if you need to do that. Um, we have the application form in a word format to help you draft and save your application and share it um, with other people to review. There are lots of frequently asked questions on there and useful case studies as well. Um, we really hope this webinar today has been useful to help you write your COF application. Um, if you have any questions, please contact us through the inquiry service on my community. Um, we'll also be putting a copy of the slides up on the my community website for you to look at. Um, and just to say thank you very much for listening. Uh, we really hope it's been helpful. <laughs>